Uh, hello, I'm actually Thomas Brostecker. Uh, I've been working for several years in Intel. Uh, first around actually uh, Linux middleware and for the last uh, four years uh, mostly on Zephyr Artos. Uh, basically in the networking uh, stack, but also in some hardware adaptation and API. And today I would like to talk about you uh, from, uh, about a very specific uh, part of uh, Zephyr, a cornerstone actually. Uh, which deserves to put uh, on the lights. And uh, that piece is the Zephyr device driver model. But first, uh, I'd like to go uh, back in time. So four years ago, uh, in 2015, uh, when actually Zephyr was not even called Zephyr, and uh, we um, not even yet open sourced, of course, uh, we had this uh, tiny OS that we believed was the next big thing to work on. And, uh, of course, as created by uh, Intel and Wind River, it was an x86 only OS. Uh, we only had a very few uh, amount of engineers. Basically, you could count them actually on 10 fingers. And um, we had actually this, uh, the kernel itself, but uh, nothing else. So, which means uh, you had actually no uh, buses, APIs, or anything. Uh, the only thing that we had was basically the not so fun Galileo actually uh, target, which was our first embedded uh, uh, device to work with. And uh, of course, uh, we had a major problem. Uh, we had no drivers. Uh, the two only drivers at that time were the UART driver and the uh, IOAPIC for the internet uh, handling. But these ones were entangled within the uh, CPU uh, specific code. Uh, it was not make uh, general. Uh, there were obviously no device uh, APIs like uh, GPU, ADC, SPI, or I2C, nothing like that. Nothing to manage uh, devices, interdependencies, because uh, most of the time there are devices that actually depend on others uh, to be uh, able to be uh, initialized, and uh, obviously you don't want that to be hard coded anywhere. And uh, no way to instance uh, as many uh, devices as you want from the same driver. Like uh, you might have actually 10 uh, UART uh, port, one driver, so 10 instance of the same driver. There were nothing like that. And at that time, Dirk, uh, Dirk, Dirk Brandoui, uh, our fellow uh, colleague, which unfortunately, unfortunately passed away in 2016, came with a solution, and uh, he came with something that would solve all the issues. It was dedicated, actually, driver model. And uh, that was actually tackling all the uh, problems. Uh, obviously, this was actually made a device agnostic, uh, so generic, in fact, that uh, it would um, be used for other problems also to be solved. It was very uh, tiny. I mean, um, I'll, uh, I'll actually, if you have uh, some curiosity, I will give you also the commit actually number and the patch is very tiny. And um, it will solve that also uh, because Zephyr is actually target, targeting actually very tiny uh, targets, and everything should, should, should be needed should be made at build time. And uh, that was the uh, his idea from the start. So even the device actually uh, ordering and uh, interdependencies and so on was done directly at build time. And uh, of course, it would enable uh, devices to export their own uh, device-specific APIs, which were uh, which still didn't exist at that time. But we were planning, of course, to do these uh, GPIOs, SPI, and whatnot. And this would uh, solve that. So it works, it's very simple, very straightforward. Uh, there are two structures, uh, but we could basically talk about only one, which is the struct device. And uh, that one uh, provide a mean to expose an initial initialization function, uh, a name for, uh, for the, the, the device instance, the API you export, and uh, if needed, uh, specific uh, data, uh, our specific configuration for the for the device, which is really a per driver specific, so it's enabled but might not be used. And uh, this structure is then, uh, among all the uh, other structures, ordered at build time, and we will see how this is done. Basically, you have your device object. And uh, when you create your device object, you uh, direct it to be inserted uh, in a specific uh, device section. And that device section will uh, then uh, gather all the device objects. And uh, because you provide a priority number to your device, uh, this is actually used, used to sort uh, this array of uh, devices. 
So you end up at build time with a section which has already an array of ordered devices. And uh, this array from the linker um, exports its uh, starting and ending point. So in the code directly, you can uh, access this array as simple as the usual. So because of these two, two pointers, you know where it starts, where it ends. And uh, in real, you have, in fact, uh, four uh, um, init levels. That's another, uh, another part of it. And these four init levels actually uh, creates four uh, specific uh, sections. Uh, all, the, all these actually uh, subsection of the device sections are pre-ordered, obviously. And uh, you have the pre-kernel one and pre-kernel two, and the post-kernel and application. They are kind of self-documented. Uh, Obviously, the pre-kernel ones are actually initialized before the post-kernel and uh, the post-kernel after an application at the end. And um, <clears throat> uh, all of it is done through just a one macro for, for the developer. It's actually as simple as that. You just have one macro, and all the heavy lifting is done from the, uh, from the actually code generated by the macro and the linker script. So you provide actually two names, the device name and the driver name. The difference is that the device name is actually an, uh, uh, not a string, and the driver name is a string. Uh, we will see that later. A function for initialization, some data if you have, some configuration information if you have, a level, whatever it is between the four actually we saw previously, a priority uh, between 0 and 99, and uh, API pointer. But uh, it was so generic, as I mentioned actually previously, that it also solved another issue later on. Uh, it was about these boot time uh, ordered subsystems. So that's Benjamin Walsh, actually from Wind Weaver, that actually brought that. And it was very simple, actually. He just uh, made one macro on top of this uh, device and API init macro. And therefore, this, um, this solution uses the device infrastructure uh, directly. Instead of actually crea um, creating, uh, I mean, or exposing uh, most of the details of the a device, it just actually generates a device which, has, which is anonymous, so no name and nothing uh, to identify it. Uh, no device-specific API, obviously. Uh, no configuration, no data. But it uh, lets you having actually some software or subsystem being uh, uh, sorted uh, out with devices. So, for instance, if you want to start the console, actually, uh, console subsystem, if you don't have a UART uh, device, device uh, started, then you, you can play with the uh, levels and uh, priority. So that was a clever use of, uh, of, the, uh, of the device infrastructure. Unfortunately, uh, like any uh, software uh, design, it always comes with some drawbacks. Uh, but there were not that many on that one. Uh, first, uh, when it was designed, uh, we um, realized that we didn't care much about actually uh, reporting errors at initialization phase. Uh, this was a really uh, conscious choice made at that time because we judge that if the device is unable to, to boot or initialize itself, then it's just dead, actually. There is nothing you can do about recovering that. But later on, it became actually uh, necessary to continue this boot uh, and uh, still function, uh, uh, even if there were some peripherals would be dead. And the hack uh, actually around that was actually to just not expose any uh, device driver API if the initialization fa fails. But that generates another drawback, which affects actually the uh, roamable uh, capability of uh, the device structure to be in a ROM. Uh, because from the beginning, uh, the point was to actually to, make, to put all this uh, device structure and uh, device configuration into the ROM so that it wouldn't eat, obviously, any RAM. But it's not the case anymore because of this. And uh, so you end up uh, eating a bit of RAM due to that. The other, uh, the other drawback is that uh, for each and every uh, device instance you have uh, from your driver, you need to hard code it directly in your driver. You need actually one device and API, uh, and API in its macro call for each instance of your driver. So that's a bit of a burden because uh, if on another board actually uh, or SOC your driver ends up having uh, N 
more instance, you will have to actually modify the driver and add this actually a device and API in it uh, macro call. But this was uh, not um, a flow, a design flow. This was actually introduced by, because of we were using kconfig at that time. And uh, kconfig uh, isn't um, as flexible as device tree uh, nowadays. And um, as we will see, there is a work tree uh, going on to uh, fix uh, that issue, hopefully. The other drawback which also actually was introduced, uh, was actually consciously introduced because of kconfig. We couldn't actually uh, overcome that, is the stored device name. Uh, I told you about the DR, uh, driver name and the device name. Uh, the string actually, the, the label actually string, is uh, actually stored in the structure, the device structure and the, the object at runtime because um, when you uh, get the bindings of your device, uh, you need actually to do a lookup, a runtime lookup, and it's basically a string comparison, actually. So going through all the devices, uh, registered devices, and it does actually a string comparison in order to find your device. So it, it's, up, of course, a bit, memor a bit of memory, having this uh, name uh, stored, and uh, you need a pointer for it, and whatnot. And the device lookup is a, ti a tiny bit slow. Obviously, at runtime, usually you do that only once uh, for uh, each uh, device get binding. It, you never actually uh, forget about the bindings that you just look up, uh, looked for, uh, up. So, but it, it slows down a tiny bit the, the boot time. But still, uh, at that time, when actually the device tree, uh, the device driver model was introduced, uh, this was actually a very clever uh, solution, and uh, we've been actually working with it since then. I mean, if you, um, if you uh, compare to any other parts of uh, Zephyr, even the kernel, actually, the kernel has changed a lot. Uh, we used to talk about fibers, for instance, uh, before uh, it got uh, open sourced, uh, which, were, which are now the cooperative threads, for instance. And uh, even the API of the kernel has changed. Even the, all the device driver specific APIs have changed a lot, GPIO, SPI, and they are still changing. The device driver model hasn't. So it was actually quite perfect in a sense uh, from the beginning. And um, if you want to know more, I really actually advise you look, uh, taking a look at uh, these two commits. They are very short, very uh, self-documented, and uh, uh, in a way quite elegant also. So let's now let's take a look at uh, use case, what it takes for a device driver developer actually to, to do. So first thing first, you get to know the API your driver will export. And for that, I decided to, to work on the watchdog because it's the simplest uh, device driver API that we have uh, for, at the moment. And it's made only with four functions. And um, so as a developer, you just get to know these functions and you implement your driver with that. So you go, uh, go along with the uh, signature and uh, you provide, uh, you expose your hardware features uh, through these four. Once it's done, uh, then uh, you are actually, uh, the only work remaining is actually to create uh, instances of this uh, driver. And that's actually very simple. Uh, you only need actually three steps uh, in the driver itself, creating an initialization function, which if necessary will do some hardware actually uh, initialization if needed. You obviously, uh, at the second stage, uh, expose, uh, I mean, uh, provide your functions uh, of this uh, watchdog driver API here. And then you do this, at the third, third stage, this uh, famous device and API, API init call. Here, I did it only once, so you have only uh, one instance. But as I said, if you uh, have n instances, you will have n calls of this micro. micro. Now I will actually uh, talk about the configuration of a device driver. Uh, this, is, was, this wasn't exactly part of the device driver model when it came because at that time we were using kconfig to uh, provide a specific configuration uh, options to the uh, device driver, but that has changed uh, because kconfig has some limitation, is, it's not scalable also for the in, uh, instances. So we moved on with the device tree. And if we take the, as an example, uh, this uh, watchdog, driver that we did, uh, if we have n instances of it, of course, one thing which uh, will change uh, from one instance to another is, for instance, the base address, where you actually uh, can attack the hardware, where the reg its registers are. 
And uh, before that, it was okay, config-based, which was quite bad. Nowadays, we use actually a device tree, and the device tree is made of two files. That's what the device driver developer will actually pay attention to. One, uh, actually, a uh, file, uh, YAML uh, file that actually describes uh, the device configuration options. So here it will actually describe the register. Uh, it's an array with an um, address and so on. And then is the DTSI uh, file which configures the device instance uh, following what you actually de described in the YAML file. So if something doesn't match, you won't be, uh, the DTS uh, process will fail and tell you that there is something wrong. And that ends up creating for you uh, these uh, macro uh, configuration options for, uh, that you can use then in the device driver. So that's the process you should follow. Usually, if you see uh, any device driver uh, PRs uh, nowadays, it will be made of uh, three uh, commits. Uh, one is the actual driver uh, code. Second is the uh, bindings, I mean, uh, the description of the, the device uh, in DTS, and then the DTSI file for whatever actually is SOC or board that the uh, driver is being used on. Uh, there is still, however, actually quite a lot of work. Uh, we have been actually working with this dr device driver model uh, very well so far, but uh, as I said, for instance, about these uh, instances, it's actually quite a pain to maintain. And uh, because we use DTS now, and DTS knows everything about your device, device it knows uh, how many instances you have from it, it knows the configuration, and uh, even though it's actually uh, used only to generate the config, uh, configuration options so far, uh, we could actually use it also to generate the actual struct uh, device instances. So yeah, there would be no device and API init call anymore. So there had been a prototype uh, being done by Bobby Nolt and uh, Erwan Goryu uh, from uh, uh, ST, uh, Microelectronics. Uh, the idea at that, uh, that time was, I don't know if it's still uh, the ID, but there will be something like that. Uh, instead of calling n times the, uh, the macro to generate your instance, you would basically have a tiny uh, commented area in your device driver with pseudocode. Uh, at that time, that was actually some pseudocode or Python code, and that the DTS will use actually uh, to uh, generate uh, the structures on the fly at the build time. So only the, of course, the drivers which are present in your uh, final uh, uh, build will, will have these instances uh, generated. So instead of having that nowadays, the uh, YAML file, DTSI, used to generate uh, this generated DTS board.conf file, you would also have this. So it will generate the device instance in built Zephyr uh, drivers or uh, wherever it matters. And that would actually uh, ease up the maintenance quite a lot and enables also a lot of other improvements uh, that we could do actually on the device driver model. And one, as I actually uh, mentioned before, about this name uh, thingy and this lookup, which is actually a bit of a drawback uh, nowadays, could be solved also through that uh, because we could actually rework uh, the structures and um, moving attributes and better removing the name. So I did a prototype uh, like two years ago, but that wasn't made around DTS. It was actually a hack around the kconfig, which is obviously what we don't want to do. We don't want to add a new type to kconfig or whatnot. But I could actually uh, show off that this uh, would uh, solve, uh, we would actually uh, save uh, quite a bit of memory because there would be no name uh, stored anywhere. And obviously, uh, you would get a faster boot because at the linking uh, time, uh, when you do a de device get binding, uh, you, would, you would already have the pointer at the linking time. So from, uh, so no uh, runtime lookup, uh, no string comparison anymore, nothing like that. And the other thing also is the uh, reshuffling the uh, structures um, uh, attributes. Uh, could uh, lead to also a gain of uh, uh, ROM and RAM. Because as I mentioned, this uh, CZNIT macro, uh, the one which is used for software uh, uh, subsystems, uh, or ordered actually in in initialization, these ones, they actually uh, do get uh, struct device config. Uh, 
and uh, created with them. But basically, none, they don't need that because they don't expose the driver API. They don't, they don't need of a specific data or configuration. So we could lose that uh, and uh, make uh, structured device config uh, optional. So it would be only generated for uh, the actual device instances and not the system, uh, the system uh, subsystems, actually software sub subsystems uh, devices. And um, yeah. So all in all, tiny modifications uh, to change the uh, device driver model, uh, that would lead uh, for a leaner uh, image in, in the end, faster one. And that's it. Uh, yeah, any questions? Yes? That, yeah, that could be a nice improvement as well. There are many, actually, things that we could uh, derive uh, from DTS because DTS has all the information there, and uh, there are plans, uh, even on the power management side, actually, to use DTS for that, and that would be definitely a good idea because currently uh, your driver, your device instance, the, uh, the initialization level and the priority is hard-coded as well, so which is uh, a burden for a uh, maintenance point of view. I don't know. We would actually uh, probably need to talk to uh, uh, Kumar Galak, actually, from Linaro, uh, who is actually uh, leading the DTS work. But uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. How much? Yeah. Another question? OK. So if you have any, and uh, yeah. you can actually uh, talk to me anytime. Uh, or actually, uh, also, uh, I'm also on Slack, obviously. Yeah, thank you.